Hi, I'm Kevin Elmy. In this presentation, we're going to cover. Yeah. I'm Kevin Elmy. In this presentation, we're going to go through designing cover crop blends, the art in design. One of the toughest steps to get when you're getting into cover cropping is taking that first step, that first dive into cover cropping. Then when we get into it, the most intimidating part is going to be the species selection and then that blend creation. Where we need to start is we have to set goals. And as a producer, I hate setting goals production-wise because the climate is going to influence what our, our end-up yields are going to be. What we need in this case is setting goals of what we want to change in our soil or in our plant production. And that's a little different in, in setting these goals. So some of these examples are, number one, we want to improve our water infiltration. We want to suppress weeds. We want to minimize erosion. We want to improve the soil nutrient availability. We want to build the organic matter or we want to reduce the insects or diseases that we see in the crops. When we go over to the animal side, now we have a few more options so we can get into the hay or silage. We can talk about grazing. When in that grazing, do are we going to be stockpile grazing it? Are we going to be rotationally grazing it? Or are we going to add, add it as supplemental feed? The next thing we need to do is take a look at our natural resource inventory. So what exactly are we dealing with? So we want to take a look at our soil textures their texture textures in that field. So is there a, a strip of sand? Is there some peat? Is there a, a clay strip? Are we dealing with any areas of salinity or salinity uh, uh, potential in on that field? Do we have any existing tree lines, uh, grass strips, sloughs? Do we have any, any other natural or introduced features like having a roadway or railway line in there which is going to change some of the the water movement in the soil? And we also need to take a look at what plants or weeds are growing there currently. And that's going to give us an indication of, of what, uh, what kind of, 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 of soil condition that we're at. Logistics. Now we're going to have to take a look at, you know, when are you going to be seeding this, this cover crop? How are you going to be seeding it? What is the seasonal weather forecast? for the next little while. So are we in a six week drought? Are we in a six week rain session? And this is where using someone like Drew Lerner is, I found is a fabulous resource, uh, an awesome way, uh, investment in, in planning, forward planning. And then how are you going to terminate these cover crops? So there's lots of questions, but this pre-planning pace you know, this way when the season hits, you don't have to be doing a lot of uh, in-season planning. You already have the plan in place. And so what Steve Groff talks about is we have to treat our cover crops like we treat our cash crops. We need to put that forward planning into it. Now, being in from Western Canada, we, we realize that the weather patterns do change. And this is where, you know, if a hailstorm comes through, if it... Uh, if we go from too wet to too dry or too dry to too wet, we need to reevaluate our situation in that in that growing season. So that's that's really important to do. So now we have that plan in place. Now we can start looking at developing these blends. So the species selection will be based on what your goals are, what your climate, your logistics, and crop rotation. At the end of the day, what our main goal is going to be is to increase plant diversity, add a green vegetative plant growing throughout that whole growing season in, in, on that soil. When we have diverse plants, we increase the diversity in the plants that we're growing. We're going to increase the diversity of root exudates being released into the soil, which is going to stimulate and foster more diverse soil biology. When we have that diverse soil biology, now we're going to have resilience in our soils. So then when we have resilience in our soils, we're going to have resilience in our plants. Really important step is, you know, that, that uh, green plant through that whole growing season. When we start talking about species, and you, people will say, well, yeah, I have lots of diversity because I'm growing oats, barley, wheat, triticale, winter wheat. When you look at that group, basically what I, when I start talking about functional plant grouping, you're, I talk about 
warm and, and cool season species. I talk about annuals, biennials, perennials. Within the different groupings, we have grasses, we have legumes, and we have broadleaf. I've taken the broadleaf group and I've broken it into th uh, three more of brassica, non-brassica, and forbs. So when we start talking diversity, what we want to do is try to check off as many of these different functional plant groups as possible. And whether it's grown at the same time or within rotation, the, the more we have growing at the same time, the, the quicker we're going to rebuild our soils. So in our grasses, warm season, cool season species, great. We have options there. We have annuals, biennials, and perennials of each. Go to the legumes, um, maybe a little more limited there. The brassicas are basically cool seasons. Your non-brassicas, very diverse group. And then the forbs, uh, there's some challenges there from the standpoint of, of, uh, of logistics, but we'll dive into that in a little bit. But these are the functional plant groups. These are the things we want to be including in our rotation and in our mixes. What we want to do when we're doing these blends is we want to avoid grain contamination. And this is in the case if you're growing uh, gluten-free oats uh, and if you're going for that market and you decide you're going to use fall rye as a fall cover crop because it's easy, there's a really good chance that fall rye is going to overwinter. It's uh, going to then potentially contaminate your oats. So we want to make sure that we minimize that green contamination aspect. And this is where if you're going to seed radishes the year before uh, seeding canola. The radishes, if they don't germinate, will germinate the next year. They'll flower, they'll go to seed, and then you'll have radish seed in your, in your canola. So once again, not a good thing. We want to avoid insect bridges. And what I mean by that is having, uh, once again, going back to the radish and then canola bit. So if you are in a crop oscillation between uh, wheat and canola, and you decide you're going to be using some radishes in there. So if you grow your wheat and you seed your radish, radishes will grow in the fall. Uh, flea beetles will then move into them. They'll start nibbling on them. The radishes will produce some winter cover. So then the, the, the uh, flea beetles will then overwinter. Then when you see your canola, bingo bango, you have your your uh, flea beetle outbreak in your canola. If you decide you want to seed radishes after canola, you seed your radishes, you, you harvest your canola, you seed your radishes. Well, the flea beetles are already in the canola so that when the radishes start po poking out, the flea beetles are going to chew them down. So you want to watch those bridges. Disease vectors. So this is, uh, once again, looking at the, the canola, the canola um, uh, complex for diseases. When we have uh, a tight canola rotation, we want to avoid brassicas in our cover crop mixes. Uh, between club root, between rhizoctonia, beyond uh, the, the pythium, all these other diseases, we want to watch those. When we're going into a, a legume crop, so uh, a cool season legume, so your peas, your lentils, fabas, uh, you know, we want to minimize those legumes we're growing the year before in a cover crop. Once again, diseases will, will come and get you. And then the antagonisms. So this is the, the big one I always uh, talk about is the allelopathy. And allelopathy is a chemical that's released from a plant into the soil that will inhibit or not allow other plants to grow beside it. And this is where fall rye, uh, the claim to fame. People grow fall rye because this way, you know, it's low maintenance, it, it controls weeds, it, it does all those good things. But when you try using covers with them, especially small seeded cover crops, there's the risk of that rye not allowing that cover crop to establish. And this is going to be, you know, the allelopathy, there's two areas of, of allelopathy uh, of release. So once is going to be in, when the rye is in the vegetative stage, in the root exudates, it will, it will contain allelopathic compounds in it. And that, that is the reason why people grow fall rye is because it keeps that crop, that, that seedling stage clean. And so if you see a cover crop into it, it has to grow through it. It's not going to be happy. Whereas if you, if you establish a cover crop before, get it down and then add the fall right to it, that will then continue to keep it clean after the cover crop is established and uh, the fall right will, will continue keeping it clean. The other stage of allelopathy release is when you harvest that fall right. So that when the plant changes from the vegetative stage to the reproductive stage, the root exudates change, uh, become more resilient to microbial breakdown, 
and the allelopath he also starts building up in the in the straw so that when you harvest that fall rye and you put that straw back on the soil, what's going to happen is that lelopathy, as that straw starts breaking down, will get released into the soil and, once again, uh, prevent other plants from growing. So that's the, the, my concern with fall rye. So basically, with the, the cover crop blends, we're, we're managing the cover crops within our cropping rotation. One of the really neat things that has, has come out of uh, the, the research is something that's that's being called the, the microbe quorum. And this is through Dr. Christine Jones and Dr. Bonnie Basler. And what they're finding is this this diversity in plants and, and root exudates. And, and the, the thing they're finding is when we have two or three species growing together, we see a synergistic, in most cases, synergistic uh, a bump in production. What Dr. Jones talks about in her YouTube videos is when we start getting to seven, eight, nine species growing at the same time, because we have this diversity in root exudates, what it does is it has a, a basically a multiplier effect. So that now we're stimulating way more biology, we're feeding uh, more diverse microbes in the soil. It's amazing how these, these plant uh, populations, communities, how they thrive in that situation. And once again, it's, you know, we're not seeding full rates of each of these species. We're making sure we're adding number one plants that are, are synergistic, that they, they play nicely with, with each other. And number two, it's going back to your plant density in, in total per, per square meter. So we don't want to overpopulate that, that stand with, uh, with any one species. So going through some of these uh, functional plant groups, uh, so your grasses, the strength of you know, it's biomass. Uh, it's a big fibrous root system. Again, we have lots of choices of, of annuals, biennials, perennials of cool season and warm season species. Uh, grasses, because of their big root system, will accumulate phosphate. And most of the grasses, as long as we're not putting a fungicide seed treatment on, are mycorrhizal friendly. The negative is they love nitrogen. And the other thing is we already have a lot of grasses in our rotation already. Our legumes, legumes, the strength, of course, they're, they're end fixers, uh, highly mycorrhizal minus the, the lupins, and it produces very high feed quality. The concerns with it is of this high phosphate requirement in order to fix the nitrogen. It also has a relatively weak secondary root system and that's the reason why it's highly mycorrhizal. And so when we start looking at the, the grasses and the legumes, the reason why we want to grow those together is because, number one, they're mycorrhizal, so they'll link up with the mycorrhizae fungi. And because the grasses will accumulate phosphate, and the legumes, because they need lots of phosphate in order to fix nitrogen, and between the, the mycorrhizae and the, the, the phosphate-solubilizing bacteria that associate with the mycorrhizae, that between the, the, the grass and the, the mycorrhizae the affiliated phosphate solubilizing bacteria, that will supply a lot of the phosphate to these legumes. The legumes in turn, once it starts fixing nitrogen, will share their nitrogen over with the grass. And this is the reason why when we do a, an OP mix, we can cut our nitrogen way back. And as long as, once again, we're not using fungicide seed treatments, and as long as we have good base phosphate levels in our soil, we can get away with using no phosphate in those, those situations. The other thing about the legumes, they tend to be an early successional plant, so that means they tend to be relatively short-lived in, in mixes. So that this way they're going to have to be either reintroduced into system, systems or, you know, allow that natural progression of, of our soils of evolution to get to the point where the natural end fixers in the soil are, are doing their job. So your broadleaves, uh, we're going to break this down into the brassicas uh, first. So the strengths, so they're, they're awesome nutrient scavengers, they're fast growing. Uh, the tuber plants are able to reallocate the nutrients deep in that soil profile to bring them up to the surface. And because they're, you know, they're, they're biennial plants by nature, but they rarely winter, winter, overwinter here, so they, they, they winter kill. So that, that means in the spring, they're, you know, they're vegetative right up to freeze up, so your carbon to nitrogen ratio is tight. You get a real quick rot in the spring, 
and those nutrients are then re-released early in the spring for that next year's crop. So this way you don't have a, a huge nutrient tie-up in year two. The concerns with it is brassicas, we, you know, most farms have brassicas in their rotation. So we are looking at some disease and bug issues. We also look at if we're going to be doing any haying, uh, it's a high moisture content of those leaves. And in a lot of cases, that those leaves are way too rich for feeding to animals, especially when you get to too high rates. So I, in, in the blends that I'm doing for people that are grazing or, or, or baling or, or silaging, I'm keeping those brassica levels extremely low. The other thing about it is when we have lots of brassicas, it tends to drive your bacteria populations. And when we have bacterial soils, Bacterial dominated soils are addicted to inputs, and this is when we want to get away from inputs, we want to reduce the amount of brassicas we are using. When we look at our non brassica strengths, um, so basically it's going to be able to add lots of diversity or more diversity to our, our rotations. Uh, they're going to have, you know, very diverse root systems. Uh, they're going to add, you know, more, just more diversity to our, to our, 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 our operations. So the, the concern with brassica, the biggest concern is your seed size may be considerably different than other species. So when you're looking at buckwheat, when you're looking at sunflowers, uh, species like that, you know, fairly big seeds. So if you're seeding with clovers, it could be a little tricky to, to get uh, the, the perfect depth for, of seeding of, of these, some of these mixes with these non brassicas The forbs, uh, forbs are a, a, a type of plant that, you know, we, we don't have in our rotation. So to, when we start increasing the, the use of some of these forbs, we're seeing some really neat things happening to our soils. So the forbs, they are adding more diversity, uh, not in our rotations. And, you know, in this case, this is a picture of some plantain. It'll grow happily underneath your canopy and, and, and do its thing and, and be happy, be, just be happy being included. Now, the, the issue is when we start looking at the forbs, is we don't have a huge selection. So right now, the three forbs we're using in, in blends are the chicory, the plantain, and the phacelia. So there's there's a fit for them. Uh, it, it's a little trickier to get them to, to fit into a, a cro cash cropping system. So once again, your species selection is now going to be directed by your goals, your seeding date, your seeding method, what the weather and climate trends are, and what your rotation looks like. So in scenario one, uh, we're going to look at a, a hundred acre field where it's a, a, a medium texture. So it's a loam and we're dealing with a full season cover crop, which we're going to be seeding in late spring. We're going to be cutting, uh, taking cut of hay and then grazing. Some of our issues we're looking at are some, some salinity in the field. We have low water infiltration and we're going to terminate at, at winter. So in this case, we're going to have some, some Japanese millet, some Italian ryegrass, Persian clover, some crimson clover, some collards, some feed beet, sunflower, and some phacelia. So there's there's a type of blend we can go through. So when we look at it, when and we break it down into that chart. So our grasses, uh, we have a, a warm season uh, uh, grass with our Japanese millet. We have cool season biennial uh, with our Italian ryegrass. When we go to late legumes, we have two cool season annuals. So the Persian and the, the crimson clover. The collards are our brassica, so cool season annual. Our facility is a cool season annual. And our non-brassica, we have a, a, a cool season annual with the beet and a warm season with the sunflower. So if we look at a different scenario, and what we want to do is have that over winter. So then we're going to have a living root right up until freeze up and then next spring we're going to have it growing so in these situations where you know we have wet fields that you know just don't want to dry up instead of allowing to the evaporation because when we have evaporation then we're going to have salinity those are, are tightly connected so what what we want to do is on these wet fields have something over winter so now we're going to do some changes so now instead of using the japanese millet and italian ryegrass we're going to use some festioleum which is a, a in this case a cross between a fescue and a ryegrass, so it will it will overwinter. We'll put in, in we'll put in some uh, some yellow blossom sweet clover. We'll put in some hairy vetch. Uh, so we'll use a, a turnip rape in this case. We'll use a, a turnip and we we'll use chicory. So the chicory, the festioleum, the hairy vetch, and the sweet clover will all overwinter. Uh, then you know adding some oats and some winter triticale, triticale will overwinter too. So. In the spring, then we can we can terminate it and then seed our next cash crop. 
and this is in this way we can have something green. We can have that biology primed uh, or tying up our nutrients. It's going to solve a lot of problems that we're seeing in agriculture right now. So once again, looking at the triangles, now we're adding a little more diversity because now we're dealing with, uh, uh, you know, some biennials. We're dealing with, uh, with, with decent diversity. So in this case, and, and, and uh, so we have 100 acres of oats, we have that loam soil. What we're going to do is look now is at a relay cover crop. So we're going to seed all at the same time as, as the oats, and we want to fix some nitrogen, we want to suppress weeds. So in this case, our issues are late weed flush, and we have low nitrogen, and we want to terminate it freeze up. So in this case, we're going to use some oats at, uh, at seeded at uh, uh, 30 seeds per square foot, so in this case, 110 pounds. And we're going to add 2.8 pounds of subterranean clover, which is going to give us 4.5 seeds per square foot of clover and half a pound of Italian ryegrass, which is 2.4 seeds per square foot. What that's going to do is it's going to, the subterranean clover grows about 2 centimeters tall. The Italian ryegrass will grow 10 to 15 centimeters tall, depending on, on the year and, and the nutrients, all the other good stuff. But it'll stay underneath the oats. So you harvest your oats. Then this green mat will, will will be underneath your your cutting bar and will stay green right up until freeze up. And this will be able to control a lot of your winter annual weeds. And because that plant is in the in the, the Italian ryegrass is in the vegetative stage, it's going to continue pumping root exudates into that soil to to help build soil structure, help with your infiltration, help with uh, tying up nitrates, all of those good things that we need to do. So, you know, instead of just going oats, now we have, uh, so I, I would call that three functional plant groups. So a cool season annual with the oats, and the Italian ryegrass is a cool season biennial, so a different plant, functional plant group, and then the subterranean clover is a cool season annual legume. In this case, what we're going to be looking at is a little drier conditions. And so this is when I was talking earlier about the, you know, the, the plant density. So in this case, we're dealing with drier soil, but we have the same issues that we want to tackle. So instead of 110 pounds of oats, we're going to back it off to 95, which is going to get us 26 seeds per square foot. And now we're going to cut back our clover and ryegrass, so we're not putting down as much. So this way, we're not putting as much stress on that whole system. Because that, that square meter of soil is only going to be able to support so many seeds per square meter. So in this case, sandy soil will back off the seeding rate, or dry spring will just back off the, the plant density. When we start looking at the, the post-harvest cover crops, now we're going to be, once again, using that soil that, you know, is, is black and nothing is growing, or, you know, in quotes, weeds are growing. Once we have a cover crop growing, those weeds will be able to be suppressed somewhat and basically what we're trying to do is tie up free nitrates when we get free nitrates in the soil nature is going to get give us plants growing uh, growing in that soil to tie up that nitrate if we don't put our cover crop mother nature will give us weeds tie up those nitrates we'll see way less weeds and once again we've abused our soils for the last you know anywhere from 60 to, to 120 years we can't just stop the we can't say grow one cover crop and say we fixed it. Uh, there may be some years where we're going to have some escapes. We're going to have some 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 issues that it, it isn't going to fix it in one year. But we're sure going to you know make some major corrections if we continue managing this way. So tie up nitrates, and then the other neat thing is when we have that green plant in the fall, it's still re releasing root exudates, which is still feeding our soil biology. Now the big question when we're dealing with our post-harvest cover crops is do we want it to winter kill or not winter kill? That is like what do you want to, how do you want to manage? And so if you want to winter kill, you know, using radishes, turnips, oats, and sunflowers, that's a, a real nice mix to, to get you green right up until snow flies. If you want it to overwinter and then plant green into it, using winter cereals, hairy vetch, sweet clover, and chicory. If you are going to be growing canola in the next three years, do not grow hairy vetch because it is naturally resistant to glyphosate, glufosinate, and your group twos. So it can be a little tricky. The other thing with it is it has about 30% hard seeds. So that, that, with that one planting, you may see seeds over the next, or plants come up in the next couple of years. 
So in the cover crop blends, I've not seen what I would call a wrong blend, but I've you know most of the blends when I take a look at it, there's going to be some changes I would I would make to it personally. I've seen a lot of blends that are you know they they basically um, pigeonhole you of what you can do because they they're so uh, specific that they're limited on on how you can use them or you know what you can see the next year. So basically, yeah, I haven't I haven't seen a crop a, a blend that I wouldn't have changed somewhat, and and this is where changing your plant diversity, uh, changing your 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 seed or plant density, the timing of when you're going to seed it or when you're going to terminate it. So you know it, it's a bit of an art when when you start looking at uh, at using these cover crops, and designing the blends. At the end of the day, diversity is more important than the density of each species to a point. It needs to be represented per square meter, but you don't need to have a full carpet. It's not your main cash crop unless it's, it, it is a full season cover crop. Your soil will only support so many plants per square foot or per square meter. So basically what we're looking at is you aim for 120% of the pure stand of your main crop. So if you're seeding oats at 30 seeds per square foot, when you're adding cover crop, 120% of 30 is 36 seeds in total of your cover crop plus your oats. When you're seeding relay cover crops, you may have to reduce the, the seeding rate of your cash crop slightly, you know, 10 to 15%, because too much competition, especially something like oats, will smother your cover crop and it, it just won't be there. Or we're going to have to look at adding it later in the season so that this way when the leaves start dropping, that's a good time. We're starting to get more light in, in interception back to the soil. Good time to get your cover crop seeded again. So when you start looking at this, and especially as a seed grower, you know, when I first got into it, I thought, oh, geez, what a mess. But once I understand how our soil biology works, this is what I want to see. I want to see that, that canopy right full and dense of, of above ground, but I also want to take a look at below ground. I want to see that those, I have some tap roots, I have some fibrous roots, I have some roots that are growing in the cool, in the warm. I want to have activity in that soil throughout the year. Whereas when we're growing these, these spring seeded cash crops, we're only feeding our soils with active roots for about 40 days. After that, we're starving it. So we need to have that green vegetative plant. We need to have the diversity of the roots. We need to help build these soils. So yeah, we, we, we definitely want to think about those root systems. Fibers versus tap, shallow deer versus deep, early versus late season growing. We want to think about the plant tolerances of cool season versus warm season or hot loving plants. Dry uh, tolerance versus wet tolerance. And we want to add that plant that stays vegetative throughout that whole growing season. Those are the major keys to get through to, to help building healthy soil. And Cotswall Seed, they, they have this uh, PDF on their website and really good uh, visualization of, of taking a look at how these different roots grow. Sometimes you need a little bit of a translator. So when you see something like Lucerin, okay, that's alfalfa, ribgrass, that's plantain. So, but it, most of it is, is fairly... Uh, fairly common to us, but you know we, we want to add this diversity of, of roots. We want to look at our rotation when we whenever when we're uh, getting into these cover crop blends. How can we add diversity to it? So these functional plant groups: warm season, cool season species, annual, biennial, perennial, diverse plant root types. We want to keep that active root growing in that soil for as many days as we can. 250, 260 days of a green plant. And that's what we need to in our soils. And in agriculture today, you know, we're you know we're we're busy, we're stressed, we're you know pushing as hard as we can, and we you know yield, yield, yield. But what we need to do is you know is the the problem that we're facing is it the the symptom or is it the cause? And we have to be able to take a step back and take a look at the big picture because we might be missing an easy solution. And in my mind, these cover crops are, are that easy button that we can be easily utilizing in our, in our systems. So thank you for your attention. And if you have uh, any further questions, there's the Imperial Seed website and their, their contact phone number. I hope you enjoyed it.